Well, New York City was a, it was an early transition. It was the, the birth of the hippies and, and the anti-war statements. And um, I played a little guitar down in the coffee shops and ran the hoot nannies. And then the British took over all the theaters on Broadway. There was My Fair Lady, there was Hamlet, there's uh, uh, Separate Tables. Uh, they took over 99% of the theaters and Off-Broadway began with the Edward Albies and, the, and that's where Carol, Chan, Carol Burnett was and Once Upon a Mattress and there was a, a The Fantastics. And we got together in 1960 at 2nd Avenue and 8th Street. And we did a Jean Genet's production of called Le Negres, The Blacks. And in that cast was uh, Roscoe Lee Brown, James Earl Jones, Godfrey Cambridge, uh, Charles Godon, um, Lex Munson, um, uh, J. Flash Riley, Abby Lincoln, Cicely Tyson, and of course, Maya Angelou. So we got together to do That Blacks, and it lasted five and a half years. So we kind of made an indelible impression upon the world public by doing Jean Genet's The Blacks at the St. Mark's Playhouse on 2nd Avenue and 8th Street. And Off-Broadway has never been the same. That's where, when we finished, and the Negro Ensemble took over the same building. That's when I first met Maya Angelou Marquet. She uh, was uh, the combination, and Jean Genet wrote it, combination of everything that Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, all the, the royalty, the white female royalty of Europe, only centuries and centuries have, 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 have uh, uh, amounted to my, my royalty. What I say goes, I mean, all that stuff. And then there's the black kings and queen that said, oh, you, you, that, 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 it was so beautifully written between Roxy Roca and Maya and how, they, how uh, the director made a dance out of it. So it was like a cockfight, but a poetic cockfight. And then Cicely Tyson playing the young black lady and, she, and she, she would mock, and one of her lines was, <clears throat> I am the lily white queen of the West. Only centuries and centuries of breeding can, uh, can make me, and I have, uh, so she's walking up this catafalque, and it was, a, it was a, a derision, but a very poetic, poetic derision, and l raised the consciousness of race to such an element that it's called the theater of the absurd. Racism is absurd. We'd have the audience, and there was a little subterfuge in the, in the ushers and the usherettes, and uh, they were put into this ambiance even before the play started, that uh, they were going to lock the doors. And we started with the locking of the doors and the secrets, and, and then finally we started with a, a, a waltz, mocking them, and then all of a sudden, uh, Roscoe Lee Brown would say, ladies and gentlemen, and the entire cast would go, ha, 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 and that started the whole thing. And people just what, what, what kind of play have we come to see here? But it's a clever depiction of how we feel when they do certain things. It was done in a beautiful artistic way, but it uh, frightened a lot of people because they had no idea that they were doing it. So there's a fright there. So now that we know we're doing it and you're angry, what are you going to do to us kind of emotion? So there's a fear. There was one woman fainted and a man had a heart attack because we were so influential and impressionable that we thought that we had them prisoner. That's one of the ambiances of the play within the play. So I guess we did it well enough for that reaction to happen. And that was the meaning of the blacks. It was a play whose time had come. It was a statement whose time had come. It was, it was the Malcolm X time. It was also the Dr. King time. Uh, and then we had uh, sensitive audiences who loved it and came back, Jane Fonda came back about a hundred times. And we had some very diplomats come from around the world to see it. And it was so riveting, uh, because uh, what it was was a secret ritual. So that we got this audience and held them captive while we tell them our story. It was just absolutely electric. And uh, when it was over, they realized it was just a play. And they were, sometimes there was no applause. But they were so impressed with what we did. But that was a play whose time had come. And it, it, it gave birth to a lot of other things. Oh, now you can say that. So let's go with uh, James Baldwin now. And let's go to uh, well, the Raisin in the Sun. We came from Raisin in the Sun to that. And then all of a sudden, plays like it and, and statements like it from all ethnic groups started to hit the, the boards. And then movies started to come. Uh, Leroy Jones, Omar Rubraka. And all of a sudden, they had a voice. Music had a voice. It was time. It was a, a renaissance time for all factions. 
It was, we were together. We were a whole bunch of people. Uh, there, there, was, there was two different sections. There was the black thing. We all go uptown and have chicken and waffles and have parties. And the, the, the party times was uh, hilarious with her and Godfrey Cambridge and, and Josephine Premise. I remember Lena Horne. I remember all of those people. And we kind of uh, was a tribe of people. But then again, we started having parties with the Jane Fondas. So it transcended into this wonderful um, Renaissance kind of society. That was off stage. But it was impressionable enough so that when we did performances, those people would show up and bring their friends. So the society grew and grew and grew. Part of that renaissance of art that happened for, the, for about 50 years there. I grew up in, in Brooklyn with some of those teachers and they're still, who are alive, are still my friends today, as a result of that society. Did you have any stories of Maya at that time? Obviously you must have spent a lot of time hanging out with her as well. And oh yeah. Uh, hanging out with Maya was, at the time, I was this young actor, you know. I'd done uh, A Reason in the Sun. I had started at the age of 17, and I had the kind of a, I called it a, a milkshake kind of life, you know. I didn't have any consciousness, and racial consciousness or anything. I was very fortunate to get the oldest work. So that deep, abiding culture, Maya was responsible for teaching me why I should be upset, why I should know more about my roots, uh, why I should behave in a certain way. Um, and it, it spread, her, her influence spread into the jazz musicians and the young people at the time. It was the, the, the Afros, the Dashikis, and I eavesdropped a lot. And I sat at, uh, around her to listen to her and her contemporaries. And I saw her at, with, uh, with Malcolm X from time to time, and people liked that. And I listened and listened and listened and planted those seeds back away. Never forgot what she said, but she was like that early. Much more angry, much more angry at the injustice. And that kind of mellowed out. And as she kind of grew, and, and with her influence, she became a poet and she became smoother. But the philosophy remained the same. Let's move on to a little talk about Roots. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did uh, Roots come about? Or how did you first hear about it? Or, or where were I, you know I, Alex Haley? I mean, how, how did that come about? Well, it came about, uh, fortunately, I was, I, I, the, the, the way I came into Roots. I, got, uh, I was fortunate enough to be on that list of actors should be, who should be in Roots. And I wanted to play Kunta uh, Kinte's father. And then I wanted to be somebody more important than James Earl Jones. Or how come, you know, we, we fought about we wanted to be in Roots. It was so important for us. I got the part I suppose I've gotten. And, um, and Maya got the part she should have gotten, and so did Cicely, and so did LeVar, and so did James Earl, and, and JD, all those people got the parts they're supposed to have, including O.J. Simpson. He was the one who was running. <laughs> but uh, we have got the parts we're supposed to go. Some clever, divine intervention got us the right parts. Alex Haley grew out of that merchant marine vessel that he wrote this thing, and it exploded on him. It, it happened bigger than anybody would expect. But here we are, about to express ourselves after all this time. And then uh, I remember the people in, in the television network saying, oh, we're going to lose some money on this one. Oh, boy, we, I, we, I've got this contract with David Wolper. Oh, he's a troublemaker, but I respect him. Oh, let's put it on one day at a time and get rid of it. And that's how Ruth started. And you see what happened. The stuff that we knew all along, some of us did not. And we talked about it in living rooms and kitchens with one another at churches. Now it's global. And the reception was outstanding, obviously. And it's nice to be part of that family, that legacy of roots. Now, even today, we're kind of uh, piggybacking on that uh, legacy of roots. Uh, Can you talk a little uh, deeper about that? Because when roots came out, it had an extraordinary impact on our culture, mm -hmm. both for whites and blacks. Mm -hmm. So it seems like few shows in American television have had that kind of impact. Can you talk about that? What, what impact did Roots have? Well, the impact that Roots had on not just America, but the world, it's a story that nobody really knew how real slavery was and how slavery came about. There's still more to talk about. But that story about doing the research and bringing those people from Africa in the Middle, middle Passage and putting them in slavery uh, to create an industry and help America in the South, uh, the specific visceral relationships that uh, was covered 
uh, at that time, quite uh, dramatically, um, was a revelation because uh, you could read about it in a, a little bit in a chapter in a history book. You can't get the feeling of how it really was. Uh, you can uh, hear some songs. You can uh, read the, the slave songs. I used to sing folk music and all the slave songs and about how hard it was. I got stories from my great grandmother who was a slave, and it wasn't all bad, but it was horrible. But not all bad because they got used to it. It was the, the revelation that we did. We knew basically what happened because we hear stories, but the world didn't really realize the, the, the horrific stories that happened during those hundreds of years and how it happened and what happened specifically through Quinta Quinte. So now uh, everybody knows. And we thought that was going to be over, and that was it. And the world responded. It shut the world down. And they would still watch it. If they put it out, they'd watch it again. Of course, we've got 12 years of slave and other things happening now. Selma, all that stuff is getting quite important. We're going to get to that place where we're getting to an evil level so we can go talk, talk about the other stories about us as a people, about our Harlem Renaissance, which Maya talked a great deal about, and the, um, the, the great people there, the great cowboys and the soldiers. And there's a bigger story. Roots is not finished. I think it had the, the roots had an effect. It did create a great deal of dialogue um, on all levels. Uh, I didn't realize it made a lot of friends, made a lot of enemies, but it was up above the table, as it is today. It, everything is above the table. Thank goodness for the computer and, and, and the, the, the internet. Uh, there's no secrets now. So the subject is still being discussed, obviously, today. And as soon as we get finished with that and we uh, get rid of all of those poisons, we can get on with this, this uh, global community that we need to have. But once again, Maya was in the middle, along with the James Baldwins and people like that, of opening up those stories in such an eloquent way to, to, uh, to help us grow with the information that we need to have about uh, how horrible slavery is anywhere. Holocaust did that, the roots started that, and it's still not over, as you can see with the productions today. And we're still on the promised land, on the way toward it, uh, a little faster than we realize because things are coming to a head. But back in those days, it's supposed to be taboo to speak like that. And we did it on international television. It's history. Can you describe, I know you weren't in the segment that Maya is in, because she plays Kunta Kinti's grandmother, and you were Fiddler later on mm -hmm. in the series, but can you just describe to us what her role was and what, her, what you thought of her performance? Uh, what I thought of uh, Maya's performance, uh, she, I don't think she said she thought about it, she just did that role. She had all the information in her system, as Cicely had. Um, she was a, one of the consummate uh, expression of her art and of her soul, uh, in Roots especially, because it was a triumphant uh, part uh, to play Mother Africa. She was the mother. Uh, the grandma, she was the one. She was the matriarch. And she uh, relished in that role. And she still relishes even today, even though she might physically be gone, she's relishing as the matriarch the poet laureate of us. Her, her, her statements ring so true. You can read a, a poet or you read a, a moment about hers and occasions come up on a daily basis when you talk about it. That's the first time I heard about it came from Maya. I mean, the first time I heard Maya talk like that was 1962. So it's her legacy has gotten quite strong. She was like my great grandmother. Um, she was very cantankerous. You don't put that much salt in the cornbread. I mean, that's, where did, where did the Fort Laureate, where'd she go? Just a minute, you know. Now, let me show you how to mix this. I, I said, why? <laughs> but that's her, her, she was imbued with uh, our roots. That's who she is. And so she had uh, lost patience, but not so negatively so. She just fussed a lot. My great-grandmother fussed a lot, you know. I have this story about my great-grandmother, which... And Maya, at her later years, was kind of guilty of the same forgetfulness. And one day, my great-grandmother and her two friends were over 80 years old. My great-grandmother died at 120, approximately, more or less. But uh, she was the mother of the First Baptist Church of Sheepshead Bay. And I was sitting in the kitchen drinking coffee. And one of the ladies said, I think I'm getting a little senile because I went to get something out of the refrigerator. And I stood there with the door open for five minutes trying to remember what I wanted to get out of the refrigerator. And then the second lady says, you know, I, I know what you mean, because I stood in my closet for 20 minutes. 20, what am I doing standing in the closet? 
And my great-grandmother said, Allah, Maya, Angelo, you should be ashamed of yourself talking about how old and senile you're getting. I'm at least 10 years older than both of you. And thank God. Who is it? <laughs> Maya was like that during her latter years because she was very cantankerous. How many times did I tell you to bring me some milk and you bring me some buttermilk? She asked for buttermilk in the first place. But when it came to talking about African roots and a legacy, clarity came to her. So the day she died, she was clear as a bell about her job in life and her transforming her information over her knowledge to somebody else. So that's an amazing process of what we have as a legacy. I guess other people have it, but we could be uh, senile, we could be uh, nervous, but when it comes to that important message, clarity hits. And Maya was not that way until she left our planet. This is a tough question, but I just want to know, uh, when you first found out that Maya had passed mm. at the end of May, um, what, what went through your mind? When did you first hear? Uh, when I heard that Maya passed, everything is quiet as it was just now. I got quiet in my system and just stop and reflect on all the experiences I've had with her. I was in this room, and there was a great silence uh, about everything. Everything stopped, and uh, the memories of her, all of them, came to, 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 to pass. Um, she said yes to my foundation. The foundation is called the E-Racism Foundation. Um, she was going to be the first board of directors, so there's a lot of lessons that she told us here's what the foundation should be about. So I was very grateful that I had her to lead me to others. And she was leading me to others, and uh, I had a lot of uh, weekly telephone conversations with her, and uh, I did her show, went to her house, and um, we, we emailed a lot of, of one another. And she said, what's going on? You know, she pushed me a lot and gave me some lessons about what direction. And those lessons are the lessons that we used to give from one generation to the next maybe three or four generations ago. That's the inspection before our hand touched the doorknob. Certain things that we were taught by our elders, our, our, our hygiene, our self-respect, our respect for the opposite sex, our respect for the elders, knowledge of our culture, uh, conflict resolution, physical fitness, spirituality, before our hand touched the doorknob. And then when we went out there, we were protected a little bit and going to school with that mindset. Conflict resolution, so somebody who does not look or feel or believe in us we could get along so that when those kids went to the school to learn, they were there receptive to learn and do positive things with it rather than negative things. We used to do that naturally, starting in Africa. There was something to do with each generation, and she reminded me of that, a lot of us, that we have to go back to those, she called them thrilling days of yesteryear, where as soon as you're able to walk, there was something you did to benefit the whole tribe. At three years old, you'd go and gather eggs, and the eggs, everybody would eat. Milk a goat, and everybody would have the goat's milk. And at five or six, there's something else you would do, and take, herd the goats and stuff. And at 15, you, you know, every age, there was something to do. And we began to lose that as we got into integration. And she got a little more upset as we started losing those basics. The, the, the ability to cook a sweet potato pie properly. The ability to pray, the ability to... Uh, read about your people and to grow on a daily basis. Started back in Africa and maintained us all through slavery. And we started, as we started to become equal, we abandoned the wrong things. And she brought us as a, a reminder that perhaps in our freedom we have to go back to those roots and add that to the whole melting pot of America, indeed the world. Those are her words. And that's her everyday action. We have something to offer society. And it's positive, not negative. And uh, there's some, some kind of uh, resistance to it. But in spite of all of that, it's probably one of the salvations of mankind, those original African roots that went through the Middle Passage, through slavery, through recovery, and now with our freedom, with uh, Maya and Dr. King, there's some value systems that are indelible, that survived all of this time, that's more relevant for the salvation of us all today. <laughs>